walk you through some resources that are available on the website. Um, and then we'll get into answering the questions. So during this time, please continue to submit questions at Slido. Um, so I want to start off with, this is not the official stance of the admissions committee. Things that we say here are based on our personal experiences and opinions as students who have gone through this process before and who are current students in the physics department here at MIT. Um, and we cannot predict or influence who will be admitted based on what happens in this webinar, but we're going to do our best to provide you with uh, information and advice that we have um, to hopefully make it the, uh, the process of applying easier for all of you. Next slide. So we're going to go over uh, a brief overview of all the components of the application. Many of you are probably already familiar with that, but if not, we'll just uh, go through them all. I'll answer some frequently asked questions, um, especially questions that we got a lot during the first webinar or we get a lot over email. And then um, talk a little bit about some of the resources on the physics website. And then we'll switch over to the Q&A um, where we will just answer questions from the Slido. Uh, you can see the, the panelists here. Um, so we have several people who are uh, members of the, the student organization that's putting on this webinar. We have a handful of other panelists who are um, just uh, you know from the, the physics department. And we also, in, in both uh, halves of the, uh, the panel, have a student member of the admissions committee who uh, you know, actually uh, sit on the committee and, and review the applications. So uh, it's great that we have them there. And then uh, hopefully joining us soon will be Sydney Miller, who's the graduate programs administrator and can help a lot with uh, all of the logistics questions that you may have too. Next slide. All right, so the application, it's due December 15th. That's very important. And we highly recommend that you uh, submit it a day or two ahead of time to avoid any technical problems. The application consists of some biographical data. Um, there is an application fee. It is $75 for MIT, but do not be afraid to ask for a waiver. And we will uh, uh, talk about that in a second on one of the FAQ slides. You need transcripts. Uh, when you apply, unofficial transcripts are fine. If you are admitted, then you will be asked to send an official transcript next summer. But for now, unofficial transcripts are fine. Uh, there are three letters of recommendation. You are allowed to submit more, but uh, we will caution you that the committee will read, uh, for the most part, will we'll read a random three. So if you have you know, three good letters and one less strong letter, um, the committee may end up reading two of your good letters and one of your and, and your one less strong letter. So that's just something to think about if you're considering submitting more than three letters. Um, there are some lists of research experiences, honors and awards, that sort of thing. And then there's the, uh, the, the big important parts, the statement of purpose, um, where you outline why you want to go to grad school, uh, why you think you will be a good fit at MIT um, and what you might want to do here. There is an optional personal statement. It is truly optional. You do not have to write something for it, but the purpose of the personal statement is just that if there's anything that you feel didn't fit in in the rest of your application that you want the committee to know, um, you should put it in this optional personal statement. And uh, another important thing is that the uh, MIT is not accepting GRE scores, uh, either the regular GRE or the physics GRE for the physics PhD program admission this year. So you do not need um, to send any GRE scores. Next slide. All right, the fee waivers mentioned this a second ago. Um, so this is coming straight from the physics department website. So all this information is available there. Um, Fee waivers are automatically available for anyone who has participated in the MIT Summer Research Program, Converge, or other MIT programs or official recruiting visits. Um, there's a link you can go to. Uh, other underrepresented and under-resourced applicants may also request a fee waiver from that same link. And if you are denied by OGE, the Office of Graduate Education, you can reach out to the physics department at this email address and request a second review because the, the physics department also has a number of fee waivers that they 
uh, support that they can give out in addition to the number that OGE will give out. But if this is something that, um, you know, if the application fee is a barrier to you and you're thinking about this, you should uh, act on this soon because um, it takes, it can take time for all of this to be processed and applications that have not paid the fee and don't have a fee waiver on December 15th will not be reviewed. So um, you should uh, act on this soon. Next slide. All right, uh, the English language tests. Uh, this is another thing that we get a lot of questions about. And um, this is again, mostly just from the, uh, the FAQ on the department website. Uh, there is not a cutoff score. We have recommended scores that um, we provide, but uh, for the entire application, nowhere in the application are there any hard cutoffs. So just because you do not score these typical scores uh, does not mean that your application will not be reviewed. But we do, uh, these are the scores at which uh, people are typically admitted. Um, and then questions about should you take it? So it is required if you are from a country in which the English is not the primary language, uh, but there are exceptions if you have been in a English speaking country for three years or longer and have received a degree from a college or university um, where the language of instruction is English. And uh, yeah, more information on the department website. Next slide. All right, faculty sponsors. This is another thing that we get a lot of questions about. Um, do you need to reach out to faculty members or have a faculty sponsor before you apply? No, you do not. This is the case for some schools, especially in other countries, but this is not at all the case for MIT. You do not have to have had any contact with faculty members um, prior to uh, uh, submitting your application. Um, once you are admitted, you, you know, at some point then in the spring, you should reach out, reach out to faculty members about working in their labs. Uh, you can also, I, I think the, the one instance where it can be acceptable to reach out to faculty members now is if you're curious, if they think they will have, uh, you know, open spots in their lab and their website does not say that, you may reach out to them, but uh, for the most part, you do not need to email a faculty member before you apply. All right, next slide. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the resources available on the physics department website. This is the link here. You can also just go to physics.mit.edu and get there through the menus. Um, there's a lot of great information on this website. I encourage you all to check it out. Um, also, I should mention that like as we're going through all these FAQs and um, things like that, um, if you have more questions about this, please put them in the Slido and we will happily answer more in-depth questions about any of these things. Um, but to continue, um, yeah, a lot of great information about the website. Um, this is just taken from towards the top of the page. Um, next slide. There are a lot of great FAQs, some of which we've talked about. I will go rapid fire through um, a lot of them, mostly just to make you aware of them. Um, but there's a lot of good information, especially about this most frequently asked question about what is included in a strong graduate application. I won't go in depth in that right now because I think everyone sort of has different questions about that. We'll let you guys just submit your question to the Slido and we will um, get to them. But uh, next slide, I will, yeah, so there's a ton of other more specific FAQs and um, just to like make you aware of all of these, because I think a lot of people miss this, i um, going to real briefly run through all of them. Next slide. So uh, this is super rapid fire, oh, uh, super rapid fire, but um, if you have more detailed questions, please put them in the slide up. Do you need a degree in physics in order to apply to the graduate program? No. Many people apply without degrees specifically in physics. They have degrees in related fields. Uh, what are the requirements to complete a PhD? A little complicated, see the website. Can you take other courses at schools nearby? Yes, you can. Plenty of people take classes at Harvard. Um, see the website for more information or you can ask us. Uh, how many years does it take to complete the requirements? Usually five to seven. How will you pay? Everyone is guaranteed funding while they're here through TAs, RAs, and fellowships. Uh, so you do not need to pay any tuition. Um, 
how many applications are submitted and how many are accepted. Somewhere on the order of 1,600 applications were uh, submitted last year and about 90 people are offered admission every year. What are the minimum grades and exam scores? There are no cutoffs. Uh, that's really important. Um, when is the deadline? December 15th, also very important. Um, COVID has made it difficult for me to take tests in person. Can you still apply? Yes, absolutely. And we are not accepting the GRE this year. So you don't need to worry about that. I already mentioned that. Um, I already talked about the TOEFL and the English language stuff. So I'll skip that. Um, and I talked about the fee waivers. Yes, there are fee waivers. Please uh, uh, start working on that soon if you think you need one. Can you arrange a visit to the physics department or specific research areas? Not currently due to the pandemic. Um, can I receive an update on the status of my application? No, uh, unfortunately, there are just too many applications. You will get an email when you submit saying that it has been submitted, but after that, um, the department will not uh, be able to give you an update until you get your offer of, um, and, until you get your email letting you know whether you were uh, admitted or not. Um, you'll be notified of a final decision before March 1st. And um, can admitted students start in a term other than the next fall semester? Very rarely, there's a little bit of information on the website. So that was super rapid fire, um, but that's just to give you a sense really of what is available on the website. And please, if you have more detailed questions about any of these, put them in the Slido and we will answer them during the next two hours. All right, next slide. All right, so now we're gonna move on to the main portion of this webinar, which is the Q&A. Um, so yes, there's a Slido link that has been put in the chat many times now. If you're just joining, hopefully uh, one of the more recent ones appears for you. There it is again. Awesome. Um, upload existing questions because we will answer them in the order of questions that have the most uh, upvotes or likes or whatever they're called on Slido. Um, there's also this physics grad and mit.edu email address if you don't get to a question. This is more at this point for, I think, sort of logistical things, but um, if there's anything pressing, feel free to email that. And we, uh, I think we've all put our divisions in our Zoom names, so you can see sort of who's here. Um, and real quick, we'll go around and introduce all the panelists, and then we'll switch over to the Slido. So uh, I'm Kyle. I'm a second year PhD student in physics in the Atomic Molecular Optical Physics Division. Um, I work in Professor Ike Chong's lab doing trapped ion quantum computing. Uh, and I also uh, spend some time working at uh, Lincoln Lab in, in Lexington doing basically the same thing. Um, and uh, yeah, let me, let's go with uh, Dominique next. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Dominica. Uh, just to double check that you can hear me. Okay, yeah, I'm Dominica. I'm also a second year uh, graduate student. Uh, I'm in the Astro division. Uh, but my research kind of lies in between divisions, as I were calling precision measurements, which kind of lies somewhere between astro, AMO, you could say condensed matter. So, um, and my advisor is also not in the physics department. So that's maybe like one other thing that you could ask, I could potentially elaborate on. I also um, spend a lot of time working on uh, FizGap itself. So if you have any questions about, you know, the department culture, admissions, how you can get involved in these things, uh, I'll be also happy to elaborate on that. Um, awesome. Let me call on Wenzer. Hi everyone, I'm Wenzer. Um, I'm a third year graduate student. I study um, dark matter and cosmology with Tracy Slatyer. So that puts me in the particle theory division, although my work also overlaps a lot with um, folks from astrophysics. Um, what else were we supposed to say? I already forgot. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll just call on. Okay, great. I'll just call on the next panelist, which for me is Hao Chen. Hello, everyone. My name is Hao Chen. Um, I'm a third year graduate student in the Astro Division, and I work with Professor Kiyoshi Masui on 21 centimeter cosmology. So I spend quite a lot of time in the department doing physics, but outside of the department, I also play a lot of music. I sing in the MIT choirs, I play the piano, and I also organize student events in my graduate student housing. So I do uh, a lot of other stuff as well. Um, so next, let's move on to Michael. Hey everyone, uh, I am Michael. 
I am a condensed matter theory graduate student. I'm in my seventh year and I'm graduating very soon. So if you wanna look at what the end of the PhD looks like, um, please feel free to send me any questions. After this, I'll be doing a postdoc working on superconducting quantum computing. Um, my current research is, is, like I said, in condensed matter theory. So lots of topological quantum field theory um, and lattice gauge theory. In addition to those two, um, I also transferred groups my first year. So if that's something that you're worried about, please shoot me any questions about that. I also took some time out of grad school to work on a startup. Um, and I can talk a lot about how supportive the partner was and all of those things. So uh, next one down the list is, uh, looks like Ellie. Hi guys, um, I'm Ellie. I'm a second year in the astrophysics division um, in the physics department. And I am a member of Professor Jacqueline Hewitt's lab. So our group works on HERA, which is a, um, it's an experiment doing 21 centimeter cosmology, looking at the epoch of reionization. Um, I guess outside of research, I um, been organizing IM sports, particularly IM hockey here. Um, and I also did a gap year before applying in particle physics. So I can talk a little bit about moving between research fields, if that would be helpful. Um, and I guess the last person who has to introduce themselves is Sydney. So I will call on her. Thank you, Ellie. Hi, everyone. Hi. I think I have two windows open. Let me do it. All right. Um, maybe we can pull up the uh, switch screens to the Slido while Sydney is uh, bringing out her. To probably to the feedback. Uh, Sydney, just jump back in when you, whenever you're ready. Um, yeah, so this is what the screen is going to look like for most of the rest of the presentation. These are just the, um, the questions that we have, and we'll be uh, highlighting and answering. And um, panelists, just uh, raise, your, raise your Zoom hand if you have something you want to say about a particular question, and I will. Uh, I'll, I will read the questions and call on panelists to uh, jump in and answer. Um, let's see, Sydney, are you ready or should we uh, jump into the questions? Okay, go ahead and introduce yourself real quick. Uh, just, oh, oh, forget it. Okay, um, maybe we will jump into the first question. Um, and um, all right, let's see. This first? Okay, cool. You can highlight the questions. All right, I do not have any experience in Astro, but have some experience in CMP with the publication. I want to change the track. Is it possible to get in as an Astro student? Um, so, I will just first say that lots of people, I think, switch research areas. I did not do the same research in undergrad that I did I do now, um, and that was fine, but I wasn't necessarily um, switching, I guess, what would be divisions here. But um, yeah, any of the other panelists? Yeah, Michael? Yeah, I uh, came in AMO experiment uh, from a background in AMO theory and ended up in CMT. So for that, uh, and I'm happy to hear if people have different experiences. I actually applied under AMO and that worked pretty well. And that let me get my feet on the ground here. Um, and I was feeling out which I liked. Is it the AMO, the theory of what I had done before? Um, and it turns out I went for theory in the end, but I applied AMO and that's the one I had a stronger application for. Um, usually when I know people applying, I would say, apply for the thing that you have like a really great track record for. And if you get to graduate school, that's not working. Um, it's usually possible to switch. Cool. Uh, Sydney? I'm going to try and introduce myself again. Can awesome. you hear me? Yes. Okay. Apologies before for the technical difficulties. I think I was signed on in four places. The short version is that I'm the staff member in charge of the admissions process. So I manage the admissions um, 
process for the physics department. I'm actually the person hiding behind physics-grad at mit.edu. So anytime you send an email there, it goes to me. Um, and I'm involved with the application fee waiver process for the department. So I'm happy to entertain your questions um, either here or by email. Thanks, and thanks for your patience. Awesome, thank you, Sydney. Um, cool, uh, any other comments on this question? Um, I think if you do want to apply um, for, I guess, I guess the CMP is, is condensed matter something is how I'm reading that, but let me know if that's wrong. Um, if you want to apply to that, um, then I think it's also possible and you can sort of highlight um, skills that you gained in your previous work. Um, or sorry, I misread that. You don't, you want to get into Astro and you have experience in condensed matter. Yeah. Um, if you want to apply Astro and you can talk about like the skills that you have you gained in your background and how those would apply and transfer over. Um, that's definitely possible, but um, yeah, I think I know people have done it both ways when they wanted to switch fields of applying with the field that they did in undergrad or applying for the field that they want to work in going forward. And I think for the most part, uh, there, a lot of professors are more than happy to have students join their groups that don't necessarily have experience in that exact field um, previously. So yeah, I think that's uh, totally doable. All right, um, a question about interviews. So what type of questions can potentially be expected at the interviews and when are they usually held? Um, so I guess I want to start by saying that um, A, not everyone gets interviews, I think it's sort of division specific whether each division will hold interviews. Um, and B, I think um, there are certainly interviews that are a little bit more um, technical, but I think there can also be interviews that are specifically aimed at gauging um, sort of the English language proficiency if there was, uh, depending on like TOEFL test scores or something like that. So. Um, yeah, I did not have an interview, um, so I can't answer to that, but is anyone who did go through an interview? Yeah, Harjan? Yeah, so I did get an interview when I applied. So I can tell everyone about my interview experience. Of course, um, as Kai already mentioned, this is division specific, not everyone gets interview and it might change from year to year. So, but I just want to tell everyone what my interview was like. So it happened just like within a week or two after the new year. So fairly soon in early or mid January, that was the time for me. And the interview was done by two professors in the Astro divisions. And the format basically just a conversation. Um, they just wanted to know my interest. They want to see me, you know, face to face to see if I can just communicate with others. So basically they did not ask me any like technical questions that clearly wasn't a test for my physics knowledge. They just asked me my interest, my research experience, what I want to do in graduate school. So for my interview, I feel like the purpose just to get to know me to know what to know more why I apply and what I intend to do um, if I get in. So overall, it's a very friendly conversation, I would say. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, anyone else want to speak about interviews? Or move on? Uh, sorry, Windows, right? Okay. Um, now a question about what uh, the most important quality that the admissions committee looks at in the statement of purpose. Um, Windsor? Yeah, so I, it's hard for me to say that there's any one particular quality that people are looking for in a statement of purpose. Um, but I think the most important things to usually highlight are um, detailing like your past relevant, like past relevant 
um, experiences to research, like research experiences or other teaching and service opportunities, as well as um, um, kind of clearly stating at some point, like why you went to go to grad school, and then um, uh, also talking about um, why you're a good fit to MIT and why MIT, like MIT's program is a good fit for you. Those are usually what we're looking for in the statement of purpose. Yeah, um, what um, Matt, the, the chair of the admissions committee said um, uh, in one of the, the training sessions uh, I was in was that they're looking for students who are going to thrive at MIT. And so demonstrating that you will do that is uh, really important. So I think that's sort of a couple of things. One, like demonstrating that you will be able to find a home in the research group here and that there are professors doing research that you're interested in. And then also then the second part is sort of showing that uh, you will be able to succeed both in that research group and in the courses and, and pass the exams. Um, and so that's sort of the more the academic side of things, which um, is largely, uh, is, is not as much, I think, the focus of this statement of purpose. It's more of your, your transcripts and, and your grades and things like that. But you can certainly talk about it in the statement of purpose. Anyone else? Um, since the personal statement is optional for the application, uh, the person is curious what people usually put if they choose to write a personal statement. Uh, Windsor? Yeah, um, so one of the reasons um, we decided to add a, a personal statement is because uh, we had gotten feedback from students that um, it would be nice to have a space to talk about things that they didn't feel that they felt might not be the most appropriate for a statement of purpose. For example, um, if you had any like extenuating circumstances during your undergrad, like um, like medical issues or like um, other things that might have affected your performance that you didn't feel comfortable detailing on the statement of purpose. Um, the personal statement is a place where you can talk about that. Um, other, for example, if you also had like um, a lot of service activities that you wanted to talk about. Um, I think it would be fine to talk about that in a statement of purpose, but if um, for some reason you didn't want to, the, the statement, the, the personal statement is also a place where you can talk about those kinds of activities. Yeah, and I do want to emphasize that it is like the, the personal statement is optional. It's really just if these are, if these are things that you wanted to add to your um, application where you felt like they didn't have a space anywhere else, then you can um, choose to submit a personal statement. Great, thanks. Um, also, I just wanna pause again. I see Dominika recently posted again the slider link. So if you're just joining us, I think there are a few people who have joined on in the last five or 10 minutes, um, head over to that Slido link and you can submit questions and upvote other questions that you want to see answered and then they'll appear on our screen here and we will uh, answer them for the, over the next you know hour and a half of this webinar. Um, cool. All right. Um, moving on to the next questions. Uh, and maybe we can for this one just sort of um, well uh, maybe I won't put everyone on the spot, but I think it, it, everyone can uh, can chime in here. So this is for, for all the grad students on the panel, what according to you was the quality or X factor that finalized your admission in the department? Um, and I think there's a really interesting question because I'm guessing it's going to be different for um, lots of people. For me, it was um, really, um, I think it's, it was important to make sure that I was going to have a home in a research group at whatever school I went to. And um, I think it can be important to have not just sort of one professor that you can see yourself working with, but but multiple in case you're uh, your first research group doesn't work out, you'll have somewhere else to go. Um, and MIT for me was the place that had multiple professors that I could see myself working with, um, where a lot of other schools that I was applying to, um, there were lots of great groups, but there was only really one that I was, you know, super interested in working with. So that was the, um, one of the biggest factors that influenced my decision to go here. Um, anybody else want to talk about uh, their reasoning? Dominica? 
Thanks, Kyle. I just wanted to make sure I understand the question correctly, because it seems like I'm not sure if it's mm -hmm. asking about I see. how, like, what was the X factor that got us into MIT or what was the X factor in our decision to actually go to MIT? But I guess my answer it kind of lies in between. So let me just sure. <laughs> go ahead and say that. Um, I feel like, uh, so before I applied to grad school, I actually was not really considering applying to US graduate schools at all because I come from Europe and so I was kind of used to the European format of a PhD as I was growing up um, but uh, what kind of this helped me to decide to come to MIT specifically was the fact that I was fortunate to have had a research experience here and so I knew I, I felt like I really knew like what I was going into and I really like knew the department and I think that might have also shown in the application and so I feel like for me, that just like emphasizes how important it is to like do the research about the institution to which you're applying to make sure that people, that there are people you can work with that all, you know, your research interests align with their research interests, like those kinds of things. And obviously it's easier if you have the in-person experience, but uh, it's also not impossible to do that like online. And, and yeah, I think that that was probably the most important thing for me. Cool. Yeah, I think you're probably right that I was misreading or misinterpreting this question. Um, so, but uh, Ellie? Um, yeah, so I guess I was planning to answer it from the what do I think helps my application be accepted to MIT angle. Yeah. Um, and I guess you can never know for sure. But I think for me, one thing that um, I really tried to do in my grad school applications was to sort of, and this has been touched on already, basically demonstrate how some combination of my research interests and past experiences would find a home in MIT. Um, and so my field now is 21 centimeter cosmology, which I had never worked in before grad school, though I had worked in particle physics and um, CMB cosmology as well. And so um, when talking about my past research experiences, I wanted to make sure to emphasize that um, some of the skills I'd learned and experiences I'd had there connected to what I wanted to do in grad school and really try to make that case. Um, yeah, so I think that is something to keep in mind when you're preparing your statement. Awesome. Uh, Michael? I can answer this question in, in both in, interpretations. So as far as to I, what I think got me into MIT, it was one good paper that people had started to use. So we had done some theoretical work on AMO, it was becoming an experiment and we had kind of, I, I could demonstrate that I had gone through not just like the dreaming up of an idea, but all of the, the really challenging real world things that go along with that. Um, and then what brought me to MIT was a place that, like I said, I was still trying to figure out where I belonged in physics. You know, I was this AMO theorist and I wasn't sure which part of that uh, I wanted to pursue. And it was a place I could do both. Um, and there's not a lot of places that have both of those strengths. Awesome, thanks. Uh, how Jen? Yeah, so if people were to ask me like what helped me to get into MIT, the, the honest answer is that I don't know. Maybe it's my undergraduate, um, like school record because I did pretty well in, in, in college. It could be like I indicated that MIT would be a good match for me because I was looking to Professor Kiyoshi Masui's research and he was, you know, just around that time happened to be looking for a student. So it could be everything, anything. So one general advice I would say is that in writing your application, one thing to do is uh, just be honest and be yourself. There is really no need to think about, oh, what kind of quality I need to bring out in my application, right? Just be who you are and be honest. I think in that way, you will, it's likely that, will, that you will end up in a place that is truly a good fit for you. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And I will second the not knowing what the, uh, the factor that got you in was. I very nearly did not apply here because I thought I had no chance of, of getting in. Um, 
and I it was almost on a whim that I decided to apply. So I will encourage people uh, who are on this call who are sort of on the edge. Um, you, you might have a better shot than you think, I guess. Um, yeah, awesome. Thanks everyone for your comments on this question. Um, and then a somewhat related question, I think, is um, how much re research is expected from applicants and do most accepted applicants have published papers? So uh, I guess my experience, I did have one like fairly small paper. It was, it was technically like a technical note, a little short thing. I, that probably did help me. Um, but I think it's also the case that people certainly get accepted here without having published papers. Um, and I think the committee is aware that, especially in undergrad, whether or not you publish a paper comes down a lot to luck as well of just being in the right place at the right time. Um, does anyone else have, have comments on this? Yeah, Windsor? Yeah, so um, I, I would say that uh, like, having papers can be useful and that it's like a great demonstration of like, yes, I've done quality research and like my advisors and collaborators think the same thing since they probably helped you get this paper out. But it's definitely not the um, only way to show that um, you have like the potential to do great research. Um, uh, I, I forget if we said this already, you know, we consider the application as a whole. And, you know, some students may come from schools where there aren't as, many opportunities for research experiences as compared to like, like large or elite research universities. And so we'll also look for like, um, that, you know, the student is curious um, that they're taking advantages of like other opportunities around their institution, like classes, teaching, um, outreach, or other research uh, related experiences. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, how Jen? Yeah, I just want to mention that when I applied to MIT, I did not have any published papers. So I did mention in my application that I was writing one, and that was indeed published later, like after I already got in. So at least for me, I don't think having a published paper really mattered that much, apparently. Mm, but I did indicate that I was working on something and working toward having a published paper. So yeah, I, I don't think that's that important, at least for my application. And how much research is, is expected from an applicant? Well, um, that varies as well. As people mentioned, it can depends on if you went to a research university or not. Um, but again, for me, I didn't do that many uh, research projects when I was an undergrad. So I was doing like, um research project on helioseismology for like four years all through my undergrad that, that's the only main thing that i did and in my senior year i started to work with um like people in the gravitational wave but really that wasn't that much so doesn't necessarily need to be a lot of research so that's at least from my experience great Amanita. um yeah i so about the paper side, I just wanted to share that I did have a publication, but it was totally unrelated to what I was looking to do in grad school. Um, obviously that, you know, no one really minded, I assume. Uh, um, and it kind of goes back to the question of like, you know, whatever like research experience or an absence of research experience you go through or whatever paper writing you go through, like it's always important to set to, to, to bring out what you've learned from that and show that in the application. Like having four years of research experience in the particular field that you wanna to apply to for grad school, I don't think it, it's, it's totally not necessary. Like there's many other ways where you can show that you really thought about your decision to apply to grad school and you have the experience to like back it up. Um, so that's just something I wanted to add. Cool. Um... Yeah, and then I think also there's this one question, um, a couple down that's basically the same thing. So I think we'll just wrap that one into this one and, and uh, call that one done as well. Unless anyone has, I think it's pretty much exactly the same question. Um, so go ahead and take care of that. 
And then now there's a question about the uh, statement of purpose, um, whether it should be long and detailed or short and concise. Um, so I think there's sort of a fairly standard length for the statement of purpose. I don't know if there's a page requirement, Windsor. Yeah, I forget exactly what the limit is for MIT, but I think there's either a page or word limit. So obviously the statement of purpose won't get, you can't make it too long because you're limited by, by the application requirements. Um, as for how detailed to get, um, I would say um, you want to, you, you want to at least detail all the activities you want to at least talk about any activities you've done that are like relevant um, to your path towards graduate school. Like if you if you have research experiences you want to talk about, you want to at least say enough um, to show like what were your contributions to this project that you understand what the project is about. Um, but you're not like you don't want to go so detailed that you're basically just like you know writing a paper within your statement of purpose, right? So. Um, there's a little bit of a balance there that you need. Hope that helps. Yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, and I maybe I'll just also chime in with a couple things that I've heard Matt say as well, um, which is just that, um, yeah, you don't want to be, yeah, you want to kind of avoid jargon to the extent possible. Um, the people who are reading your application will not uh, at least until the sort of the end of the process probably will not be, you know, in your subfield. Um, and uh, you maybe want to avoid sort of describing to the professor what their research is, um, because especially if, if you're wrong about what their research is, you know, they'll see that. And then if you're right, well, they already know what their research is because they're the one doing that research. Um, but uh, you definitely want to, yeah, provide um, specific details about what you did uh, in, in your past research experiences. Um, all right. So what specifically um, is uh, the admissions committee looking for when shortlisting from huge numbers of applicants, um, GPA, extracurricul extracurriculars, et cetera? Um, Windsor, you want to take a first crack at this one? Great, thanks. Yeah, so um, again, there's, it's not like we rank different components by order and say, oh, we're going to take like the people who have the top 10 GPA or whatever. Um, we've really been trying to move towards um, um, uh, considering the application as a whole, holistic admissions. Um, and uh, so, um, so we'll look, yeah, we'll look at all the components of an application, you know, your letters, your statement, um, maybe parts of your transcript. Um, but it's not as if any, like, it's not as if weakness in any one category then like um, cuts you out from um, consideration for admissions. We really try to look at, um, the quality of the application as a whole. So we're trying to move away from cutoffs in any one category. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really important point that um, we try to stress a lot is that there are no cutoffs at any point in uh, the admissions process. So great. Um, Sydney? I just want to add, I mean, yeah, it's absolutely holistic, but I, but as the bigger picture, and this goes back to the statement, understand that your application is one of many, many, many applications. So who are you? What makes you different? You know, we want to know something about you as an individual. We want to know more about um, what interests you, not only what you've done, but what excited you about what you did. This is your opportunity to tell us that. Um, please don't try to play the game of trying to be the perfect profiled uh, magical applicant because that doesn't exist. Just be the best version of yourself in your application. Um, I know that sounds really corny, but it's actually really true. Yeah, awesome. 
All right. Uh, so this is a question that um, I talked about in the, the FAQ at the beginning, um, but I will reiterate it briefly. Um, should you first contact a potential research supervisor from MIT before submitting your application? No, you absolutely do not need to contact research supervisors before you apply. Um, this can be the case at other schools, especially in other countries, but it's not at all the case here. Um, some people do try and email professors, but they're very busy. And I think the response rate at this point is pretty low until you have been admitted, at which point you're much more likely to get responses um, from professors who are yeah, looking to add people to their groups. All right. Anything else or you good to move on with this one? All right. Um, how much harder is it to get into theory versus experiment for physics PhD in general? So I think this partially falls into the category of questions that we got some the last webinar also, which is like sort of ranking different areas by how hard they are to get in and I will just say that I don't think any of us have sort of any statistics on, you know, how many people apply to an area versus how many they admit. So I don't know if we can give you hard numbers on that, but um, Michael? Yeah, I don't have hard numbers to add to that, but I've talked to a few people going into, uh, you know, theory or experiment, and I also was trying to figure that out. Um, I think the best thing to do is apply for the subject that you could see yourself doing for which you have the strongest application, right? For which you like have done work in and you can really tell a story like I will do really well there. And if you get there and it doesn't work out, you can't switch. Um, you know, when I switched from AMO experiment to theory here at MIT, there were some people who were like, oh, you can't switch. It's harder again and it's more competitive or something like that. And that was just not true. I actually um, found it very straightforward and everybody was just concerned with helping me find a place where I could do good research. Um, so my generic advice on that is like, you know, tell a story that really makes a lot of sense for you and that you can see yourself doing. And if that doesn't work out you know, in all good faith, uh, you can find another way. Yeah, that's, uh, that's great. Windsor? Yeah, I think this is also difficult to answer because um, it can vary from year to year uh, how many students are admitted to the different divisions, right? So for example, not just at MIT, but I've heard these stories at other schools, maybe, you know, one of the divisions will get a huge like yield of students one year, like, like maybe 80% of the students that they admitted decided to accept. And so then the next year, um, because like they don't have enough funding for more students, they'll maybe admit like two students. So, um, yeah, so it's it's hard to compare because of fluctuations like this. Yeah, Sydney. Um, I just want to add that this relates to the issue of um, changing areas or describing what your your interests are. When we make the admissions decisions, um, we have a conversation about whether we believe we have a path for funding that particular applicant long term, um, not just for the first year, but long term. Now, that doesn't mean the applicant necessarily is going to stay in the area where we know about the path. That applicant may, when they get here as a first year student, find that they have other interests. But then, and I, I think maybe Michael can speak to this a little bit, then that student really has to go around and meet people in that new area they want to study in and introduce themselves and make sure that the people in that area know who they are and that there's someone who can supervise them. And that will impact the next year's um, admission cycle that that particular group will have already sort of pre-admitted someone to their group. So we really do make a very big effort to think about what the long-term funding prospects are. That said, as a reminder, because we have a large undergraduate program here in physics, there are many, many, many teaching assistantships in addition to research assistantships um, and fellowships. And so that gives us opportunities to provide funding. There's something called a transitional TA if people are changing areas. So there are ways to do this and we're all trying to work together to make sure the student has funding and a path for supervision as well as funding. 
Yeah, Cindy, and, and just to jump back on that, I, I very much agree with that, um, having transitioned. And there, there is a, a challenging part there where you have to go find a new advisor and knock on doors um, and introduce yourself. And it requires a lot of extroversion, which I don't think I had at the time. Um, but it, you know, that is fundamentally going to be an important thing to do as you go on in science at some point or the other. Um, and also to, to, you know, share maybe a personal anecdote. I didn't realize when I was applying to graduate school how much more it's like a job interview than undergraduate admissions. So when I applied the first time, I was just getting out of college and I actually got into Stanford for stuff. Um, but I chose to go to a master's program and they wouldn't uh, delay my admission. So I said, okay, that's fine. I'll apply next year. And I didn't get in, even though I was now more qualified. And that was just because those positions had been filled. It's not like undergrad where you sort of like get over a bar. They're actually trying to match you to specific research that's there. And that changes every year. Um, and of course, you know, it's, it's very hard to see uh, exactly how that works out. Yeah, awesome. Um, maybe, let's see, we'll do one more, um, this sort of somewhat related question here, and then we'll uh, pause and swap the, the panelists in and out for the, the second hour. So um, is it true that each grad student will be guaranteed full funding? Um, the short answer to this is pretty much yes. Um, and as was mentioned, there's even this transitional funding that's guaranteed that if you want to switch advisors at any point during your PhD, um, you have a semester of guaranteed TA ship that you can you can you're guaranteed to be able to be a TA and be funded by that for a semester as you work to find a new group and a new professor who can support you. Um, yeah, anything I'm missing on on that? Okay, um, let's see. So it's now eleven. Um, so I know some of the panelists need to go and we have a few other panelists hopping on. So any panelists who need to leave can hop out. Um, also take this moment to remind people to uh, check out the Slido, the QR code on the screen or Dominique has been pasting in the chat, the, the link that you can go to um, and submit and especially upload existing questions. Um, uh, and yeah, we'll give a second for the new round of panelists uh to join and we'll do some introductions um awesome so let's see mason you're you're, you're on panelist duty this hour right i am okay awesome um so why don't we go ahead and get started with the introductions? Um, so, uh, maybe I, should, I don't know. Do you think enough people have joined that I should reintroduce myself? For sure, it'll only take a second. Yeah. All right. So I'm Kyle. Um, I am a second year in AMO. Uh, I work in Ike Chuang's group doing trapped ion quantum computing. Um, I'm a member of uh, Gaga and Physgap, the student groups that put this on. Um, and, uh, and I also work uh, at uh, Lincoln Lab in Lexington um, a few days a week. All right, uh, Dominica. Yeah, so hi everyone who's just joined. Uh, I'm Dominica, I'm a second year astro student here in, at MIT Physics. Um, so a couple of things I can speak to is having an advisor from a different department, being an international student and being part of um, student groups like uh, FISGAP and GAGA who uh, work to improve admissions processes at MIT. Awesome, uh, Mason. Hi everyone, I'm Mason. I'm a fourth year astro student. I'm also part of FISGAP and GAGA and I'm also a member on the graduate admissions committee. And uh, if you allow me to say one more thing. So I noticed an inappropriate comment on the slide earlier on and uh, please do not add those comments into Slido. We take it very seriously here at MIT. Uh, so we would appreciate it if you don't add such inappropriate comments onto the Slido. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is uh, this, this webinar is a service that we're putting on for all of you to try and, and help you make this uh, admissions process easier. So I, yeah, please, please be respectful in, in the questions that you submit and we'll try and get to as many of them as we can. Um, Great. Uh, let's see. 
Caitlin, Kate? Hi, I'm Caitlin or Kate. Um, I'm a grad student, fourth fourth year grad student in the Astro Division. I work with uh, Professor Kiyoshi Masui. I'm not involved with FizGap or Gaga, but I am involved with uh, FizRoss, which is another student group. Um, I'm not really sure if there's anything else I have to say. No, that's great. Uh, Lisa? Hi, I'm Lisa. I'm a first year uh, condensed matter theory student. So I do not have a formal advisor yet. I am still rotating. Um, and yeah, is there anything else I should be saying? Oh, that's great. Just, yeah, whatever you want to, um, people watching to know. Um, well, Devin? Hi, I'm Devin. I'm also a first year. I'm in the Astro Division. Um, I just popped in, so I don't know exactly what everyone is saying. Oh, um, just uh, who, who you work for, what you work on, and anything else, any, I don't know, any other things that you're involved with that people can ask you questions about. Okay, yeah, I'm, like I said, I'm in the Astro Division. I'm in very early stages of research with Scott Hughes working on black hole perturbation theory, which sounds kind of scary, but really just looking at supermassive black holes and what happens when you have like a stellar black hole orbiting it. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Awesome. And then uh, Sydney, maybe reintroduce yourself as well. Uh, my name is Sydney Miller. I'm the staff person in charge of managing the admissions process, and I'm the face behind physics-grad at mit.edu when you send questions. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Um, appreciate uh, you all joining us and, and uh, helping answer some questions today. So. Um, to recap for the panelists and for everyone in the audience, we are using the Slido. Uh, Dominique has been posting the, uh, the link in the chat uh, every couple minutes. Um, for people who, as you've joined, there's also a QR code on the screen, or you can go to slido.com and type in that uh, FizGap webinar code. Um, so please go there to submit your questions and upvote existing questions that you want answered. Uh, and then they will appear on our screen and I will highlight questions and read them out and then um, call on panelists who raise their hands to uh, answer the questions. So go ahead and uh, get started again. So can the letter of recommendation come after the deadline on December 15th, uh, Sydney? Um, yes, there's probably about a week um, when letters are still uh, trickling in from applicants. But um, just to explain the process, um, on December 16th, we will start, or I, we will start um, identifying applications that are complete. And three letters of recommendation that have arrived by then make an application complete. If you've asked for a fourth, that's where we start our process. And we don't necessarily wait for the fourth letter. We talked about that earlier. Um, there's always a couple more days when faculty are writing letters and sending them. Um, after a few days of that, it's important to reach out and make sure that they're still sending them because around Christmas time, so the 25th, we're going to, or maybe the 20th even, we're going to start looking at your application based on it being basically incomplete. And assuming that the three letters, the three people you chose to write letters for you are all saying something important about your application, the early evaluators are going to see an incomplete application from you. That's, that's how I would answer that question. Um, I welcome other people to jump in here. Yeah, I think, um, you know, keep, keep bugging your, uh, your letter writers, basically, and, and try and get them to get those letters in um, as soon as possible. Um, and I'll also say again, regarding the December 15th deadline, even on your part of the application, I highly recommend getting it submitted a day or two early so that you don't run into any technical problems. Um, I should also add for anyone who's joining that this webinar is re being recorded. So if you missed any part of the first half, we answered some FAQs that are also all available on the physics department website. Um, so you can either check those out on the website or the webinar will be uh, uh, posted at some point um, after we finish. All right. Um, so how to brand and differentiate myself as an academic or upcoming researcher in applications. So I think this is something we've talked a little bit about as far as, um, you know, don't just try and fit into the mold of what you think the perfect grad school applicant is, but um, 
does anyone have uh, thoughts on specifically how you differentiated yourself um, in your applications? Mason? Yeah, so I might not remember what the folks in the first half said, but I think, you know, you want to talk about your contributions to any research project, you know, and the output can come in many ways, you know, it can come off as papers or posters or presentations or uh, improving the efficiency of the workflow in the lab. Yeah, cool. Um, Devin? Yeah, I don't know what was said in the early half, but I guess one piece of advice that I got that I got positive feedback on in my applications was like avoid cliches. If you're applying for Astro, you know, don't start with, I've always loved looking at the stars and the try, you know, things like that. Um, talking about your passion in an interesting way, you know, just saying like, I'm so passionate. Like, everyone's passionate, that's what you're applying, you know unpack that more and be a little bit more specific. Um, so yeah, avoid cliches, be specific. Don't just repeat passion, 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 because you're applying to this program, of course you're passionate. Yeah, awesome. Uh, Lisa, and then we'll move on to the next question. Um, I think it might be useful to be able to, um, if you have ex a variety of research experiences in a variety of areas, being able to take the skills and the topics that you learn from one area and sort of making an argument for how that would be useful for whatever research area to which you're applying. So for instance, I'm in condensed matter theory right now, but you know, I have a, a couple years of experience doing high energy particle experiment, um, but you know, there are certain things like data analysis and running simulations and writing simple models and things that are sort of can be universally applied to multiple different fields. So rather than treating um, your application as just a simple enumeration of your different experiences, being able to translate those experiences and um, apply them to whatever it is that you want to do at MIT. Yeah, that's great. Cool, um, move on to the next question. Do international applicants have any dis disadvantage or need to show extra effort compared with uh, locals? Um, Dominica? Uh, yeah, so as I said, I am an international student. I came from the, I did my undergrad in the UK. Um, and I have to say that even though, well, so, so there's one point I'd like to stress, which is that the, the admissions process works totally the same, no matter which institution you're applying from. Um, there is, you know, there's the same requirements hold for everyone. Uh, having said that, if you're an international applicant, I feel like the, the one thing that's, that you need to grapple with the most is that you don't really, you're not used to the education system and you're, you don't really normally know how the applications in, for example, US graduate programs are judged. So, so there it's very important to like, you know, ask questions like these because then, you know, current students or people who have experience or maybe some career advisors at your institutions can help you like figure out, you know, oh, in the US, they, for example, you know, expect you to have done some research experience uh, when you apply for grad school, because that's how you support your case. And, um, you know, all these like meta knowledge, <laughs> I guess that's the hardest part for an international student to like, acquire. Um, but that's why we really want to put out resources like these out there. Yeah, great. Uh, Mason? Yeah, I'll also just add, I'm also an international student and I kind of plus one to everything Dominica um, uh, just said, uh, you know, in the applications themselves, though, you know, in the, the admissions committee don't look uh, uh, at your application any different. You know, the only thing that we might just have in mind is that we may not be familiar with your education system, but um, there are avenues or there are parts in the application where you are able to explain to us what the what your system entails and uh, we'll be able to get some good context from there. Cool. 
All right, which of these is the most important references, statement of purpose, GPA, undergrad institute research experience, number of publication? Could you rank their importance? I'm guessing the answer to this is uh, going to be no, but maybe I'll let Mason give uh, his, his stance from the admissions committee's point of view. Yeah, no, thanks, Kyle. Uh, yeah, there is no such thing as a rank of importance. So we look at applications in a holistic manner, meaning that we look at your application from the first page to the last page, and only after that do we make a some form of decision about, about you. So, you know, don't worry, that's like a little blip in your application. So, you know, if your sophomore, second year, um, spring had some B minus or something, you know, don't, don't, don't let that be, uh, uh, don't let it worry too much. Yeah. Um, Sydney? Oh, only to add that, you know, if you feel there was something very specific going on in your sophomore year that you want to talk about in your personal statement, that would be one of the ways you could use a personal statement. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, and just a reminder, the, the personal statement is the sort of secondary optional statement in addition to your statement of purpose that you can put any information that you uh, didn't think was contained in the rest of the application that you want the committee to know about. Cool. Um, the application process asks us about uh, other schools to which we are applying. How is this information used? Sydney? I just want to add that I saw another question about um, how many other schools did people apply to who are here? Maybe we can roll those together. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think Mason, you also had your hand up. Yeah, I will say that, you know, given my unfamiliarity with the US education system when I applied kind of four years ago, five years ago now, um, I applied to something like 16 or 17 US schools. And I think I also applied to one in uh, Europe. Um, that's about it. But I, I guess just answering the actual question itself, um, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I don't personally use that information when I evaluate applications, but certainly I'm not sure if we actually use that information somehow at all. Yeah, go ahead, Sydney. I mean, I wouldn't say it's used explicitly. I mean, I, I do think there are parts of the application where um, it helps us to have a sense of the research areas of interest the applicant may have, um, because as we all know, um, the fields in the application, the fields that we list on our website, the fields as we experience them don't always perfectly match. And so some of these questions help us to surface what the actual area of interest may be. Um, I think it would look uh, a little strange if somebody wasn't applying anywhere else at all, um, but I, I don't think it's really used pro or con for applicants. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, on the question of like how many schools did people apply to, um, I think a pretty typical number for US students applying to grad school is sort of, I don't know, six to 10 ish, somewhere in there. I think I applied to seven, um, something like that. But uh, yeah, Dominica? I just wanted to add a little comment for like international students uh regarding this question which is like if make sure you know what you're getting into if you're applying to the us as an international student because the education system is a lot different than in many places i know of certainly many places in europe um so you know just for context i only apply to four schools in the us and I applied to two programs, two different programs at one school when I was applying um, with the, I guess, rationale being that I only want to go that far away from home if I have like a really good reason to go. So, so hence the small number of institutions I apply to. And, um, so that's, you know, it's not for everyone, you know, make sure you know what you're getting into. Yeah. Yeah, that's really important because it is it is pretty different in, uh, in different countries. So cool. Uh, all right, moving on to the next question. Uh, how is the lifestyle of a typical MIT physics grad student? Um, can I, I can start with my experience, but um, I don't think there necessarily is a, a typical grad student, but 
I think it's a pretty common experience that for the first two years, you're pretty busy with your classes and with various exams. And so that definitely takes up a lot of time and energy and, and can be stressful um, for sure. And then uh, I think after that, once you pass the, the qualifying exams and the required classes, um, things open up a lot and you can really choose how you wanna spend your time, how much time you wanna spend in lab and make your own hours and, and things like that. Um, Sydney? Again, I saw another question about whether this, how the lifestyle is based on the stipend that students are paid. And I wonder if we can include this in this question perhaps. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, the, so I guess I'll, I'll say the stipend, uh, we've been getting raises, so it keeps changing, but I think it's like 42,000 or something right now, somewhere in that ballpark, um, which is definitely on the high end for US physics PhD programs, but the cost of living in Boston is also on the high end. Um, so, but um, I think it definitely works out where, you know, grad students are not starving, you have enough money to pay rent and afford groceries and, and things like that. Um, but you're not going to be living in, you know, a luxury uh, apartment and, you know, a, you know, a penthouse downtown or anything like that. Um, but it's enough to get by. Um, let's see, uh, I don't remember who's came first, but Kate? I, yeah, I want to second a lot of what Kyle said. My first two, three years were really busy with classes and uh, fall exams, um, especially my first year where uh, physics classes were pretty heavy for me. Um, it definitely felt like kind of an extension of undergrad in the sense that I was spending a lot of energy doing homework problem sets, but also like sort of different because I was trying to um, you know, uh, be more involved with research and think of that. And also, um, I remember thinking, wow, like in undergrad, I took four classes a semester and I was fine. And in grad school, I'm dying with only two classes a semester. Um, so don't be surprised. I feel like that's a pretty common experience. The classes can be challenging. Um, but yeah, so I'm in my fourth year. I've uh, passed all my exams and I've passed all my uh, coursework requirements. And I would say um, it def I'm definitely able to kind of treat grad school more like a job in the sense that I could come in and I could leave and I don't have to bring my work home if I don't want to. It's not like I have a homework that's due tomorrow. Obvious, uh, obviously, if there are like deadlines that I have to meet in terms of, I don't know, like app, uh, converse, uh, com conference apps or abstracts or some stuff like that, I'm sure the the midnight candle might be burning a little bit. I might be working a bit more um, maybe at home, but um, yeah, I'm also not sure that there's a typical uh, student lifestyle, but yeah, I also want to second that I've personally, as someone who like doesn't have any dependents um, and lives with roommates and doesn't have any like major medical bills, uh, I'm, I find the stipends quite reasonable for me. I cook meals for myself as much as I can to you know, help the money go a bit longer. But yeah, hopefully that touched upon a lot of the questions. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Uh, Devin? Yeah, I honestly think it has mainly been covered so far, so I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, I was personally hit pretty hard in terms of like coursework and just like not having enough time to do things right when I started. I'm in my first year, so I've only been here, you know, just one semester. Um, but, you know, by talking to like grad students at other universities, the first year, especially the first semester, is going to hit you hard no matter where you go. It's um, mainly just from like the volume of the assignments. That being said, if I wasn't doing these assignments, I would not be like learning this material as deeply. You know, you can't just like go to lecture. Really interacting with the material is a big thing. So that's a big time constraint. Um, so yeah, I guess not a lot to add in terms of like, it's a lot of work, but I have turned in all my assignments. <laughs> mostly complete so like it can be done um in terms of money you know i live off campus with roommates and has been fine monetarily speaking boston's expensive but to my knowledge the stipend has been fine um so yeah sorry not a lot to add everyone else really covered it yeah cool uh, uh lisa do you have something to add yeah, I mean, just really quickly. So I know a lot of people have been talking about how there's a large volume of assignments and it's really tough, especially in the first couple of years, which is totally true. But you you will still have time to like go out and explore the city on weekends and do fun things. Like I'm in a band here and 
involved with my dorm and like the student, the physics student council and things like that. So it does feel a lot more like undergrad, like an extension of undergraduate rather than full-time research so far, but you will have time to do the things that you enjoy doing as well. Cool. Uh, awesome. All right. So next question is, can you give some numbers regarding acceptance rate number of students admitted in each field every year? I think I've already said that we count. We, we don't have those numbers really. Um, the overall number I, I gave at the very beginning in the presentation, I think is like last year, there were about 1600 applicants and usually 90-ish offers of admission each year, depending on funding and how many students uh, accepted their admission last year and things like that. Um, Mason? Yeah, to add on to that, if you're really curious, you can go onto this website that I just, just posted in the chat. So it's by Institutional Research, which is a it's kind of a group at MIT that compiles a lot of statistics related to MIT stuff. And in there, you can find uh, information going back, I think, 10 years on the number of applicants and also the number of admitted applicants in all of the departments around MIT. So again, if you're really curious, you're free to check that out. Yeah, but I assume that just gives the numbers for physics and not, you know, astro or something like that. That's right, only by departments. Yeah, okay, cool. I think that's as much as we can say about this question. Um, we've talked about it a lot already. Um, so do one or two gap years affect my application? Um, let's see, is there anyone here who took a gap year? Or Sydney, you have something to say? I did not take a gap year, but um, I will say that if you took one or two gap years, you definitely want to talk about what you did during that time, whether it's in your statement of pur purpose or your um, optional personal statement will be up to you. Um, I wouldn't just leave a gap um, in my um, transcript without addressing it. Um, in most cases, you've done something that you chose to do, whether it was directly related to physics or related to your personal um, edification and growth, and we'd like to know about it. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's similar to the advice that I've heard from other people. Just, yeah, you know, explain what you were doing. And um, even if it's not like, you know, exactly the research you're going to be doing in grad school or something like that, you certainly would have picked up, you know, some skill or another that would probably be applicable to research as a grad student. So maybe talk about something like that. Uh, all right. Um, but I think that, that it's not like we, there are plenty of people who do take gap years and come here. It's not like, you know, a big thing that you have to overcome in your application or anything like that. Uh, Sorry, can I add something? Yep. So, um, just because this is a question that often comes up, whether people are allowed to defer their start date by um, usually it's a one year uh, period of time. Um, we definitely allow people to defer their start date after they've been offered admission. Um, technically speaking, you have to apply and request a deferral of your start date. It's almost always for one year. In rare circumstances, there may be a two-year program people are doing. And sometimes, this was a question I saw earlier, people might defer for one term or one and a half years and start in a spring term. So it, it's really easier for people if they start in an August term or if they start early in the summer doing early research. So there's some fluidity around that, um, but technically you have to apply and we will save your funding offer for a year, which is not true at all programs. Not everyone is, not every department here at MIT or every physics program is able to do that, but the that's the other question you should be asking about deferring a year if and when you're offered admission. Yeah, and I will say I, so I did not end up like using the deferral, but the, the I will say the department was super flexible and accommodating because I was waiting to hear back on some, on like a Fulbright or something like that when um, the deadline came around and the department, um, you know, Kathy didn't even make me, I didn't even have to know by the time I accepted admission, whether or not I was going to be taking that deferral as long, you know, I let them know well ahead of time and, and that worked out really well. So they were super flexible about that. So if you're applying for Fulbrights or Churchill's or whatever, any of those, that it should be no problem, I think. Cool. Um, let's see, we just talked about the stipend thing. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and mark that one done. And then, um, 
I have a question about when will admitted students begin research and is there rotation opportunities? Um, so I will, I think uh, Lisa probably will have a, a comment here about the rotations, but I will start by saying that rotations are not sort of standard. Um, it's, but it's something that you can set up yourself, um, but I'll go ahead and let Lisa speak to that. Yeah, so um, I am a first year. I'm currently doing rotations. Um, basically, my understanding of how rotations in the MIT physics department work, and Sydney, Sydney can correct me if I say anything egregiously uh, wrong, is that uh, essentially the physics department guarantees funding for all of its first year students, either through some kind of fellowship or through an RA ship. Um, and typically most theory and some experimental students will get a fellowship and other experimental students will get an RA ship if there's a specific PI who has committed to taking them on. And what this funding does is that is essentially guarantees that you don't have to worry about committing to a lab for the entire duration of your first year. Um, but there is no formal rotation program within the physics department. So it's sort of up to you to set up any sort of rotation that you might be interested in. So I'm actually currently rotating with a professor in the mechanical engineering department doing some more applied math stuff. And then I'm planning on switching labs and trying something out with one of the biophysics professors here. Um, so it is very flexible. Um, MIT in general is sort of very decentralized and departmental barriers are pretty low. If there are um, faculty members in other departments doing, you know, like physics related research or research on things that you're interested in. Um, but yeah, it's sort of up to you to make of that what you will. Yeah, great. Uh, Kate? Yeah, so there definitely is no formal uh, rotation, uh, I guess, structure, but the opportunities do differ by division. Um, so I'm an astro, but I've had friends in biophysics and I hear in biophysics, it's much more expected that you do um, rotations in your first year because a lot of their students are admitted on fellowship as opposed to RA ship. Um, and also in astro, there are some students here who have uh, kind of, you know, talked with individual professors been like, hey, I'm interested in your research. Is it okay if I do like uh, like a rotation with you for a semester and kind of try out a shorter term project. And for the most part, professors do seem to be okay with that. Um, and then you can kind of choose um, towards the end of your first year, which research group you would like to commit to. Um, that, and I think the other thing I want to touch upon is that admitted students really begin research as soon as they want to, or as soon as they can, kind of in my experience. Um, so, Obviously, it's really hard with classes um, to get as much research done as you would like. But as far as going to group meetings or attending or, or reading papers and stuff, um, you can kind of you know, start that as soon as you uh, are able to. And um, the final thing that I want to mention is that even though there might not be like a formal rotation structure, I would say there is pretty good support for if you also want to switch research groups. So maybe not in terms of a rotation capacity, but say you committed to a research group for most of your first year and your second year and sometime in your second year, you realize, hey, actually, this is not the research group I want to work in for a variety of reasons. Um, and then this kind of, you know, you can get support through the transitional TA funding that Sydney had mentioned earlier as you try and look for a different research group that you want to join. Yeah, awesome. Uh, Sydney? Um, a few things. I mean, I think there's murkiness for people around this issue of fellowships versus RA offers. And I, I, I guess I want to shed a teeny bit of light on this. The department simply does not have enough fellowship funding from our donors for the number of students we would want to have start in any given year or be here um, through the following seven years. 
We have um, supervisory capacity, we have research capacity, but in the first year, we simply don't have, you know, 45 fellowships. So any, and the fellowships are sort of allocated across different research groups um, according to some murky formula. So any groups that want to admit additional numbers of students for that first year must find research assistantship funding for the first year for those students. And there are some areas of research that are sort of growing more than others, or maybe they have a new faculty member. There are all sorts of reasons why that, that may be the case that are not remotely transparent to an applicant. Um, and, you know, I'm sorry that there's not much transparency, but that's just how it is. I will say regarding um, the sense of rotations or the sense of experimenting or talking to different faculty members, um, I don't know if we've been explicit about this, but towards the end of the first year of uh, student study here in this program, we, the department starts asking you who your supervisor is or which group you're, you're attaching yourself to. That doesn't mean that you need to have an answer at that point, but you would probably be looking at a transitional TA if you don't have an answer to that. Um, and I will also say that the sooner you can decide, generally speaking, which research area you want to be in, the more these classes that you're taking will sort of fit into requirements. And if you don't know what research area, broadly speaking, what research area you're going to be in until your second, third, fourth year, you will find you're probably going to have to take some additional classes and it's going to delay your getting started on research and forming a committee and all these other things. Your oral exam is determined by the area that you're in. There's just a lot of things that start happening in the second year or the second half of the second year that would start being more relevant according to the research group you're in. Well, uh, Dominica? Just a quick note um, for the first part of this question. Uh, I was one of the students who came in who with, I guess I already had an advisor when I enrolled at MIT. So I did not go through the rotation period. Um, what I hear is that many people choose to start the research the summer before enrolling in grad school. I did not do that. And I think, I don't think there is any pressure to actually do that. And I was actually quite happy to take that break away from any commitment. Yeah, yeah, I also definitely took a break that summer and uh, enjoyed myself a little bit. Um, but if you want to start research right away, that's definitely uh, an option depending, I think your professor has to have the funding available for that. So that's sort of a, a lab specific question, but a lot of labs that is possible. All right, um, I think we've more or less already answered this one. So, um, Unless anyone has something to add, uh, I think I'll go ahead and mark it as done as well. Um, and I think we already talked about the expectation, maybe in the first half, of people having or not having papers. Plenty of people apply without papers and um, get admitted as well. Okay. Um, and then maybe we sort of mentioned this and I said how many I applied to, but if anyone else wants to chime in with how many other programs they applied to, you're welcome to. Otherwise, um, I mean, if it's helpful, I applied to nine programs, which I think is average for someone. I was from um, an undergraduate in the, <laughs> wow, I can't speak. I did my undergraduate in the US in Chicago. I applied to nine schools, which I think is normal for someone with my background. And like I said, I applied to seven. Um, all right. Um, how much does GPA matter? Um, yeah, we've sort of talked a lot about how much the different parts of the application matter. Um, I don't know if anyone has anything they want to say specifically on GPA. Maybe the one thing that I would add is like, um, this has sort of been mentioned, but if you you know, if there's a semester or something where you got bad grades for some particular reason, maybe put that in the optional personal statement and explain that a little bit if um, if that's some information that you want the admissions committee to know about. Um, that's a place for that to go. Yeah, Sydney? Just to add that it's, it's less about the overall GPA, but they are going to look at what classes you've taken. And there's a section on the application where you can highlight the classes you feel are most relevant to your application. 
um, whether they're in physics, math, or wh whatever they're in, um, there's a nice little chart that um, is difficult to fill in sometimes in terms of what textbooks you used or whatever. But um, that's where you can highlight that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's much more important, the, specifically the physics classes, than your, uh, you know, I don't know, Romanian poetry class or whatever. Um, Dominica? Very quickly, on the international um, side, and make sure you use the um, the field where they ask you to explain the grading system and at your institution. Uh, for example, I came from a, from an institution where a 70% was a first <laughs> pass with flying colors, uh, whereas in the US that would be probably like a C or something. Um, and I kind of felt very weird about it, but like having the chance to explain um, the context of the grade or the interpretation of the grade is, is, is nice. Yeah, cool. Um, all right, a question specifically about plasma physics. I don't think any of us here are in plasma physics. Um, the little bit that I know is, so there's one, I think, first year student who does plasma physics this year. Um, I think there are, so it, you know, it's not a very big cohort of, of plasma physics students, but I think there's a, a nuclear engineering or something where currently more of the students go, but my, my sense is that sort of swings back and forth over the, the decades of whether more people do that through physics or whether they do it through the nuclear engineering or whatever that program is. Um, but there is there is one student this year who is in the physics program who is doing plasma physics. Um, anyone else have anything to add about plasma physics? Okay, so yeah, I maybe suggest looking at the. I don't know if it's technically called nuclear engineering or whatever it is, but I'm sure you can find it. Um, look into that and then compare it to the physics department and decide which one you think is the better fit for what you want to do. Um, how should we think about a core GPA than we are hoping for as we consider applying? Um, this is, yeah, we've talked about this a lot, but um, the admissions committee reads applications in a holistic manner. So one bad part of your application does not mean that you're sunk. Um, you can certainly make up for it with other areas of your applica application. Um, and if there's something you want to explain, talk about it in your uh, optional personal statement. Cool. Um, and this person is asking us to share experience while doing research with professors or supervisors at MIT. Um, so not entirely sure exactly what they want to get out of this, but um, I think there's a Maybe the point that I would make is that there's a very wide variety of professors and advising styles at MIT, and you should talk to the professor during the open house and ask them about their advising style. For instance, my advisor is very hands off and um, that, for the most part, works well for me. Um, but there are plenty of advisors that are more hands on if that's what you want. Um, Kate? Oh, yeah, so I came into MIT not knowing which professor I wanted to work for or um, other, I, I basically didn't know what I was going to do other than Astro and I took some um, upper classes advice and talked to as many professors as possible and I realized, oh, I wanted a professor who um, was kind of more hands on that was a style that would like work better for me. Um, and I think that ended up uh, mattering to me more than the specific research that they were doing. Of course, this varies by person as well, but for me, finding a good advisor fit was great. I'm in my fourth year of my grad program. I still love it here because I you know, really enjoy working with my advisor and that's a huge part of it. Um, but other than that, I wouldn't say that you know, there's anything special about a super research supervisor at MIT as opposed to a research supervisor at other places because you know everyone has their own styles and you just want to try and find what's right for you. Yeah. Um, I would also suggest talking not just to the professor, but you, you should definitely talk to the professor and, and you know ask them straight up what their advising style is like, but also talk to their students and ask their students what they think their advisor's advising style is because um, those aren't always the same. 
Um, does anyone at MIT Astro work on particle dark matter? I'm not qualified to answer this. Mason? Yeah, I think a lot of the folks that are working on particle dark matter are more affiliated with the nuclear and particle physics side of things. So actually, uh, Wenzo, who you recall from the first hour of the webinar, she's uh, doing this work. Um, but, you know, if you wanted someone to list off faculty, I think Tracy Scratcher was one of them. So there was Wenzo's uh, advisor, I think Shirsten Perez was also one of those um, people working on particle dark matter. And then there are some uh, folks that are also doing some flavors of, of this in either the direct detection aspect or the theoretical modeling aspect as well that are uh, in nuclear particle physics. But I think in Astro, we don't really do any form of, you know, any form of those nuclear particle type things. Yeah, maybe um, something else to note is that, like, if you're not sure which division, astro or nuclear particle, or like if you want to do LIGO and you don't know astro versus AMO or whatever, you can just come in with one, you know, put one on your application. And then as you go through your first year or two, you can decide which one um, you'd rather be in. You'll probably will take classes in both if you're doing research that overlaps with both. But the, the bigger thing is just which one do you want to take the oral qualifying exam in um, and so you can take the classes and figure that out and make up your minds uh, later there are plenty of people who you know didn't make up their minds in their first semester which um, which division they wanted to take their calls in um, Sydney um, just very quickly you know there's a great resource that a lot of people have difficulty finding apologies for that um, that's the MIT research website. It's www.mit.edu. That's the main website slash research. Um, and there's a Google search term in there where you can put in anything you like and get a sense of not only which physics faculty may be involved in an area, but as we mentioned earlier re with respect to plasma, which faculty and other departments may be involved. And, and that might be a very helpful resource for you. I can, I can put it in the chat. Um, section for you. And also, if you're not certain about how to describe your research interests with those drop down menu options, which really don't map perfectly to other research areas, um, as we describe them, this is where putting in the names of the faculty whose research most interests you helps us best direct your application when we receive it. So all of these things. Um, oh, thank you, Mason. That was very nice of you. Um, <laughs> All of these things are ways for us to make sure that the right people are looking at your application and your application is getting the, the fairest possible read that it can. Yeah. Um, awesome. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, talk about the professors in your statement. That's a great point. Um, and Mason put the link to um, that in the chat. So check that out if you're interested. Um, this is sort of related, uh, interdisciplinary research um, at MIT. So uh, I can talk from experience that like it's pretty easy to like collaborate with other groups if that's something that your professor was up for. It, you know, you just kind of go and, and talk to them and, and uh, you can set that up if your professor's up for that. Um, Dominica, I think, works with a professor who's in Mackey. I'm not sure if she's here right now, but that's also possible. and. Um, yeah, I think the, the barriers to doing that are pretty low. Um, Mason? And one more thing I'll add as well is that the, the department recently introduced a PhD in physics, statistics, and data science degree, um, which as the name uh, is saying, you know, it incorporates a bunch of like stats and probabilities, uh, probability into a degree as well. And, you know, it just means that your thesis as a a major component in statistics. Um, so, you know, that can involve things like machine learning or Bayes, Bayesian statistics. Um, and it is a relatively new program. And if you want to check it out, I also just put the link down in the chat. Awesome. Cool. Um, got a little over 10 minutes left. So, let me try and kind of rapid fire. Oh, what is happening to the screen? Um, try, and, try and move quickly and then see how many of these we can get knocked out. Um, writing in your statement of purpose, how important is including interest in extracurriculars at MIT? I don't think that's hugely important, but you like service work would be more important than saying that you want to join the wind ensemble or something like that, I think is that's what you want to focus on. The stuff that's relevant to the department. Um, yeah, I else want to chime in. Um, 
Okay. Um, yeah, Howard transcripts from different students judged. Um, Dominica had a great point that you should use that box to explain how the grading system at your school works. Um, and the admissions committee, I think, will do their best to sort of fairly compare uh, transcripts of students from different schools. All right. Um, so due to COVID, it's hard to do summer research internships overseas. How will this affect my application? Um, I guess I will say that it's probably equally hard for everyone. So, um, you know, don't stress too much about it, Mason. Yeah, I was going to say the, the same thing that Kyle did, but also, you know, from the admissions committee point of view, we do recognize that COVID-19 has had a major impact on everyone's um, research progress or just finding opportunities uh, at all. And, you know, this especially applies to folks that are doing um, work in the, in the physically in the lab. Um, so, you know, I think the main thing that you want to do is you want to talk about that in your statements and talk about how COVID-19 has impacted you and perhaps you know, if you had the opportunity to, you know, what you did to either, you know, uh, look for opportunities other than what you were uh, hoping for, or what else you did uh, during the time. Awesome. All right. Um, this person is asking about summer research opportunities at MIT from an international student studying in the United States. I'm guessing this is someone who is not applying this cycle, who is an undergrad looking um, for opportunities, although that may be wrong. Um, I know there's like the MIT summer research program and, and things like that. Oh yeah, Dominica. Uh, yeah, so the short answer is that from my, like based on my knowledge, there's not that many like pre-organized student, pre-organized research programs that you can apply to as an international student. Um, however, I think it's always good to try and email a specific professor if you're interested in uh, doing some kind of research project with them. Obviously, you know, they don't have to and they will likely not reply to the email because most people are busy, but, you know, some people might notice your email and you might start a conversation about, you know, composing a research project for you and trying to find funding either at your own home institution or via some, you know, some countries have governmental support programs that you can apply to for grants for research. Yeah, it's all a lot of research um, on the internet probably and talking to people at your institution. Yeah, um, as far as if this person is a grad student, I don't think that is as available, but what I will say is that a lot of professors this is kind of co-opting the question a little bit, but a lot of professors at MIT will allow you to do internships or things like that at other places. Um, so for instance, Lincoln Lab, where I work, uh, grad students from other places could intern there over the summers or something like that. Um, Sydney? Just that this goes back to the other question, the other comment earlier about MIT having sort of a decentralized um, culture. Whereas the MSRP is centrally organized from the Office of Graduate Education at MIT, these individual research opportunities would be from you as a prospective applicant directly to the um, faculty member or PI in a lab. And if you have someone you're working with at your undergrad or maybe current grad institution, asking them if they have any ongoing relationships with faculty um, here, um, but you really are, would have to reach out on an individual basis to individual faculty and labs. Yeah. All right, um, there's a couple of these that we've already done, so I'll kind of move quickly through them. Someone's asking about if they got a B during COVID, maybe write about that in your personal statement or something like that. Um, uh, the overall grad school application process, right, applications due the 15th. If you have an interview, which you may not, based on the department, that's in early January, we will be notified of your decision before March 1st, and then you have to notify MIT of your decision by April 15th. Um, so that's sort of the timeline there. Um, this is a question I do want to 
get through our fee waivers open to international applicants or only US citizens and permanent residents? And pretty sure the answer to that is they're open to everyone, but Sydney, you can speak, right? Speaking as the person who is going through applications for um, fee waivers currently from international students. So um, MIT has um, a fee waiver, application fee waiver program from the Office of Graduate Education for US students and permanent residents and for international students who are in the US and who've participated in certain specific outreach programs at, at, um, at MIT. Um, including the MSRP, the summer research. Um, other students may request an application fee waiver of me, basically physics-grad at mit.edu. We have been inundated, legitimately and understandably inundated by requests from people who are, are looking for application fee waivers. And we are trying to be um, as liberal as possible uh, about our response. I will say that currently um, there is a priority given to international students who have not yet had the opportunity to leave their home country for study, um, whether that's to come to the US or the UK or anywhere else. So um, that is something that we're, we're looking at. That doesn't mean that we won't have any application fee waivers for people who are international students studying in the US, um, but they, I'm sorry, just aren't as high a priority um, in our current program as it's structured. I'm willing to take other questions from people about this um, either by email, but we are trying very hard. I will also say I've had some, um, if you're reapplying from a previous year and you had a fee waiver in a previous year, um, that may also make you a lower priority from our perspective. Please don't take any of this personally. It really isn't designed to be personal. It's just really, we're trying to help as many people as we possibly can. Yeah, and I do wanna shout out the physics department again for like supplying the funding for this on top of what MIT already supplies. A, a lot of this money is just coming out of the physics department budget to uh, allow these fee waivers to exist. So, um, we, we are fortunate to have generous donors who make funding available to the physics department and allow us a lot of freedom in terms of how we spend money on programs, this and student activities for current students. Um, many departments at MIT are far more constrained than we are. So we're very, very fortunate and appreciative. Yeah. Um, okay, question. Oh, let's keep moving around. Um, uh, let's see, what is the probability that one's, more than one student from the same undergraduate institute gets selected for the PhD at MIT? Um, I, I doubt that's taken into account in the application process. Um, Mason? Yeah, Sydney's nodding there. And as someone on the committee, I can say that uh, we don't take that into account when we make the decisions as well. Cool. Um, this we've already talked about also, can we get into a non-physics lab if we get into the physics department? Seems like that's perfectly possible. You may need a physics department co-advisor, Sydney. That's precisely what I was going to say. When you, when you um, are putting together your thesis committee, you will need members of the physics department on your committee to make sure that it's a physics degree but you may certainly work in um, with, it's not just labs actually, because a lot of the labs are interdisciplinary, but with a supervisor who is in another department or actually you could also have a supervisor at Harvard or, or other institutions, but you would absolutely need to have a, um, an MIT physics department co-supervisor um, as well on your committee. Great. Um... Okay, if you're sure about your prospective research area and you only talk about it in your SOP, is that harmful, harmful for the application? Um, and so I would say that, I, I, from what I've heard, it sounds like you probably don't wanna box yourself in into just one research area. For one, that professor may not be taking students, but also the department's gonna look at that and see that maybe it's less likely that you'll find a home in the department. Um, Sydney? I just, I just want to, I, I, I completely agree with that. I think you can frame this as explaining what it is that interests you about that person's research area and the faculty will be able to extrapolate from that 
Um, and uh, in the event that you're given an offer of admission, you can discuss that further. Um, it, in some cases, applicants really feel very firmly that's the one and only person they really do want to work with. But in general, um, the stage of applying for a program is a, generally a little earlier than someone who would be putting together a research um, proposal. That doesn't happen for another two years. So just explain to us why it is that you're so interested in that person's work. Um, it, it maybe be explicit about if you're willing to consider other areas. Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. Yeah, I think just a message in chat, I think the person who said this question, that it wasn't one specific faculty member, it was an area of research. And I think that's totally fine. I think plenty of people apply with one area of research that they're interested in and name a few faculty in that area. Um, so yeah, I think that should be fine. Um, okay, and I see this on the screen, how do I get a free waiver physics-grad at MIT.edu, but start with the OGE link, and that's all on the physics department website from the, the FAQ section. Um, we are pretty much at time right now, um, so I think we should switch over to the sort of the exit poll, um, Dominica. So we'll probably stop sharing the screen here. Um, and uh, thank you so much to everyone for coming. Uh, please fill out um, this uh, this survey here if you have any feedback about the webinar, and we'll take it into account for next year when we uh, do these. Uh, again, and, and hopefully continue to improve on the program. Thank you uh, so much to all of the panelists and Sydney for um, coming and helping out. We really appreciate it. Um, yeah, uh, we got through a ton of questions. Um, and yeah, uh, any any final like uh, sort of logistic questions? Again, you can go to physics-grad at mit.edu, but please uh, keep in mind that they get a lot of Sydney specifically at that email address gets a lot of emails. So, you know, patience is appreciated. Cool. All right. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, and uh, I guess we'll, we'll we'll post the webinar when it's when the recording is done being transcripted and all of that. And will there be an email sent out about that? Or will that just be on the website? I believe we just have it on the website. OK, so yeah, just check back on the website. Cool. All right. Uh, well, with that, I will go ahead and uh, close the meeting. But uh, yeah, thank you everyone for coming and uh, have a good day. Good luck on your applications.